Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Scubana e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Scubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. And today, we have Tom Sanders. I searched near and far. Chad helped me because he can be no, he, nowhere to be found on the internet. Tom Sanders is founder of OurPamperedHome.com. They were ranked among the top 100 sellers overall on Amazon. They have, to give you an idea, they have had over 212,756 reviews at the present time and counting. They have year over year growth of over 40% for the past 12 years and have grown into one of the top online retailers. Tom, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for having me. I'm really excited. And like I was saying before, you're really hard to track down. There's not much information about you. And so I want to get into talking about some of the benefits to staying hidden. Because right now, obviously, you're not because we're talking. What are some yep. of the benefits to that? Um, as, as a small retailer, as a, a startup, somebody selling something on eBay, Amazon, you know, one of the emerging marketplaces like a New Egg or Sears, um, that as you start to build some momentum and some steam, uh, some of the bigger sellers like, you know, we are today or, you know, whoever the big sellers were when we were small, mm -hmm. um, you know, don't really want their, their pie to be eaten into. So mm -hmm. not putting yourself out there in as much of the, not necessarily public eye, but even a, you know, in a hidden sense, but gloating about, you know, what you've done and so forth mm -hmm. makes other people want to, you know, maybe Replicate kick your butt. You. Yeah. You know, take and do what you've done, take a piece of that action. And we just never, never saw a need to, to put ourselves out there. It didn't help in a sense to growing the business. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I was asked to, to hear and speak and thought that, uh, it would be, you know, something good. Yeah. So, so what are the benefits to getting out there now? Um, at this point, getting out there for us yeah. is, you know, kind of just telling our story, yeah. um, helping some of the people who, when we were small, there was never, there's, there is not a how-to book. There is not a, this is what you should do to run an e-commerce business. This is right. what you should do when you, you hit some of those roadblocks. Um, and, I, you know, I stayed up many, many late nights, years of late nights and weekends trying to get this business model running and to something that, you know, I can feed my family, I can, you know, afford, you know, a house and food and a car. Right. Um, and in the beginning, it was a struggle that just nobody had a, an idea of what to do. Um, you know, there wasn't anything eight, ten years ago right. of what to Just trial and error. You know, so I want to get into when you were up those late nights, what was working and then what were some mistakes you made. But I want to start with some of the big challenges because we were talking right before we were starting about some of the biggest challenges in the beginning and then now. So what, tell me about in, those. In the challenges in the beginning versus now are really a lot of the same things. Mm -hmm. It's when we were small and we were operating actually out of, our house at the time out of it started in a closet went to the bedroom hmm. went to the rest of the house and then so forth um was space and where do you put it how do you operate and as we continue to grow it's still space it's just we need a lot more of it mm -hmm. and capital you know how do you buy stuff in the beginning it was we bought you know five hundred dollars in product from a vendor and we you know kept reinvesting it and to sell online, you need a lot more product than just, you know, a couple thousand dollars in goods. Right. Um, depending on what you sell, that may last you the afternoon. And you're needing, at this scale, millions of dollars right. in inventory to be able to last you 30 days. It's it's a struggle. It's a lot. Going, yeah, going from, you know, a business that has 
five hundred thousand dollars in inventory to to double in size, you need to find another half million dollars. You're either reinvesting right. yourself to get to that critical scale, or you find banks that somehow have a knowledge of what an e-commerce business does. Mm -hmm. uh, both are are difficult. So, what are the best solutions you have found? for capital purposes and what are maybe some of the worst that you discovered never to do again? Um, the, the absolute best is discipline. Um, when we started this business, uh, and my dad is the other owner, um, that's where the, the TNT Enterprises come gotcha, from. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, is me and my dad, Tom and Tom. Uh, it was a, a strict discipline of if you profit $100, that at least in the beginning, $100 wasn't enough to take out and do anything with. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you profit, let's say $10,000, you need to be reinvesting a whole lot of that, not just cutting yourself a check for $10,000 because you get used to that. Your business, you know, all of a sudden doesn't have as great of a week, a month, whatever. Mm -hmm. And you still want to take out that $10,000 and right. your business starts to, to scale down right. and ultimately goes into the death spiral and, you know, we all forget your name. So how long did you take before you were just reinvesting everything? We yeah. were reinvesting everything for years. Years? Years. Without, I didn't take a, a dollar paycheck until a couple years in to, yeah. to the business being, you know, at that point, a halfway decent size. Um, we were still small compared to what we are now, but we went years without taking any real money. Yeah. How do you decide that this is the time to take some money? Um, once it was full time, once I had no other source of income uh, and quit my other job and said, this is, this is it. Um, a lot of people said, you're, you're not a real business until you start taking a paycheck. And uh, we, you know, more or less to prove them right, took a paycheck just to right. uh, <laughs> have, have it justifiable. <laughs> So what about other ways to get capital? Obviously, reinvesting. What about outside? Are there outside means necessary? Um, find a, a good credit card company. Yeah. Uh, that'll at least get you 30 days of funds. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll be shocked at some of the credit card limits that you can get if you're, really, if you're good about paying your bill. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's a 30-day. If you get 30 days from your vendor and 30 days on a credit card, you got 60 days. Um, you can, you know... You can buy and sell stuff and get rid of it in less than 60 days a lot of times. Right. Um, on top of that, you know, you've got, we bank, you know, not a, I'm not plugging Bank of America whatsoever, um, but we bank with Bank of America. We have a, a halfway decent line of credit with them as we continue to grow. Yeah. Um, and Amazon Lending as a, uh, their new program. Yeah. Um, it's, the interest rate isn't as great as you'll get from a bank. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a lot, I think, right? Yeah, it's, you know, you're getting, it, depending on what, you know, status you're at with Amazon, uh, it determines your rate and your experience there, but it's still not the best, um, but it's easy. It, you know, you can have money in three days right. uh, into your checking account, which yeah. is awesome. So, um, you know, reinvesting, line of credit, Amazon lending, credit cards. So at the, at the height, Tom... How many credit cards would you say you had out? Just we, we still have credit cards out. No, um, I mean you still have them out, but I mean you know one person I talked to, I think they had they took I forgot how many, ten credit cards or something. They oh, put no. thirty thousand each on, and they had like three hundred thousand. No. So uh, we've had a lot better success having one really large credit card mm -hmm. um, that we is our go-to card. We we have three credit cards. For, well, four. Sorry. We have four credit cards for this business. One just as a like minor expense card. Mm -hmm. I don't want to carry around the big card with us because you can pay off your house with it. Right. Um, <laughs> you don't want someone paying off their house with it. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, just our kind of minor expense mm -hmm. card if you need something on it. Um, and then we have three other cards uh, that we use for, for purchasing, um, mm -hmm. an American Express and a Visa, uh, and then kind of a backup American Express uh, if our cards get hacked or fraud, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it seems like every couple weeks, um, 
Bank of America's calling. So really? Yeah. It's well, we deal with so many different vendors that they have a you know something, and it seems like UPS is delivering a new credit card for one of us here that has them on a weekly basis. So is it truly someone scamming your card, or is it just like a off purchase that you made with a vendor? No, uh, it's somebody used it for inmate, you know, a collect call to an inmate to oh try to, you know, try it. They went to Home Depot and, you know, bought something. They went to Pizza Hut and bought $200 in pizza. It, I've had all. that happen, actually. <laughs> they did the same thing. <laughs> we've had it all um, happen on credit cards. And Bank of America is really good. They know, they have a list of all our vendors and they can, you know, check it out. So, yeah. Okay. They you detect know. fraud really quickly. Yeah. You know, what about oh. terms, Tom? So, you know, a big thing, obviously, capital's big, and then yep. terms with vendors. Tell me, what should people know and do when dealing with their vendors in terms? Um, it dep- we'll, we won't even go for terms on vendors when they're, you know, what we would consider smaller. Um, there's some that we will, but you really, you have to be diligent about paying them to keep that relationship because as your business grows, you don't want them to say, well, your line of credit with us is $5,000, $10,000, whatever it may be. And your orders now are $25,000 and them not scale your, your line of credit Mm -hmm. because you're slow paying your invoices. Right. Um, right. You know, you, you have to be able to rely on them as they rely on you. Right. Uh, You know, they get your product, you get the money. Yeah. You, know, every, you do that, everything goes, you know, perfect. Yeah. I want to go into the early days in a second, how you went from the closet to your bedroom to the house to a warehouse. But, but first, just in general, what mistakes should people avoid? What common mistakes do you see people, other people making? Um, not knowing how to buy mm-hmm. and what to buy. You know, you can't buy just what you you think is going to sell, you have to have some hard data. And if you're, you're buying something just to try it out, don't go taking pallet loads of them. Uh, because if it fails, if it doesn't work, if there's no margin in it, mm-hmm. whatever the reason may be, you don't want to be stuck with something. Yeah. And we'll see vendor or not vendors, but other sellers going out and buying stuff that we look at it and just say, there is no rhyme or reason to what this person is doing. And why are they buying right. some of these items yeah. that, by all means, probably are, are not great sellers? Yeah. So what's an example of that, if you could say? What was one that you <laughs> saw it was horrible, and you're like, why are they even buying this? Um, I don't want to call out the seller. You don't have to call it the seller, but what, were they, what was the actual product? Like, what type of product was it? it just, we've seen it so many times, it's, it's really difficult to, to pick up on examples. But you'll see some people buying toys that just, they're toys from a movie three years ago or something along those lines. Mm. And they're either stuck with the inventory still, or they just, you know, they went through a catalog and said, give me, give me six of everything. And you probably could have parsed that order down quite a bit, saved yourself some money and put it to, into products that are going to serve your business better mm-hmm. than just trying to increase your SKU count because mm-hmm. there's sellers out there with a hundred thousand SKUs in their catalog mm-hmm. that are still doing less business than we are. Uh, it's picking the right items and knowing, mm-hmm. knowing what you're buying before you buy it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's a kind of a science, kind of an art. Um, new vendors are more the art where the repurchasing and how many you buy is the science behind it. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's something that when you're a little seller you don't have that history you don't have that knowledge Uh, you have to really build up that you know essentially your your black book of in a a home and kitchen category at a whatever sales rank you need this many Um, and if you're competing against five other sellers you need to deduct some sort of multiple from that um, and being able to know how things are going to do just by looking at a page. Mm-hmm. And um, fortunately here, we've 
got a lot of that data um, that we've compiled over years, but it does change um, with, let's say, Amazon, for example, growing year over year at this hyper rate. Um, what you what your data says now is not going to be the same. It's not gravity. It's not a constant. Right. But things do change on all marketplaces. And uh, so, what's your decision? Talk about Tom your decision making in the beginning compared to now. Like, what type of data? What things were you looking at in the beginning and now? How has it grown? And how's it gotten more sophisticated? Um, in the beginning, we. Uh, we took a real, what we called in the beginning, a shotgun approach. You just, you sawed off the barrel of your shotgun and you fired it out <laughs> at, you know, a few hundred products. Right. Uh, you know, and we did what small sellers typically do. Right. Um, they don't have that data. And, and we, in the beginning, we sold vacuum supplies. That's what this business started on was kind of the home and kitchen mm -hmm. vacuum products. And it's like, you know what, bring in a hundred different bags. And we'll bring in a couple of each. Uh, what sold, you rebuy. What doesn't, you know, you probably still have, probably still have in the back in the mm -hmm. back of the warehouse here, <laughs> till ten years later. But uh, that in the beginning, it was just a let's go out there and let's increase you count. Um, there was a whole lot more money to be made online though, ten years ago, uh, before there was what two million, two and a half million seller accounts on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, Pricing has eroded. Uh, fees have gone up. Not that either of those are necessarily a bad thing. They kind of are both a bad thing. But um, in the beginning, you could gamble a bit more on stuff, mm -hmm. and it would work out. Where now, if you drop a bunch of money on on goods and you don't mm -hmm. have, you know, a backup amount of cash to keep you going you could really, you know, do some negative impact to your business. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've had some, you know, some buys in the beginning that didn't work out. There wasn't the, the money in it that we thought. There wasn't the volume. But the, the last time we've had a real bad, uh, bad instance that whether myself and I still purchase product here or my wife is another purchaser or my mm -hmm. father purchases um, that we've had a really bad one is it's been a while. So we've been very, very fortunate. Yeah. So tell me what's some of the decision making process look like today that you can share? Um, I've stopped taking on as many new vendors. Um, my wife and father both are still kind of building, uh, out there, uh, let's say catalog, individual catalogs. Um, my wife, when she came onto the business, I told her originally, hey, we have this, this vacuum supplier. We're buying stuff from them. We're doing really well with it. Just look through their, you know, look through their catalog, figure out what you want to buy. And she had quit her job, moved here to Lake Havasu, where we operate. And it, I gave her about 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And she, she was ready to, to leave. Just go Why? find something because she hates, she doesn't like vacuum stuff. She doesn't want to buy vacuum stuff. <laughs> I can see that. Okay. I can understand <laughs> that. But I, I'm not going to come in here for the next however many years and buy vacuum stuff because it bores me to tears. Right. So at the time I said, what do you want to buy? You know, what, what Famous is going to. Famous last words, Tom. <laughs> yeah. What are you going to, what's going to entertain you and keep you. Uh, excited. Right. And the first product that she bought, we still sell to this day. We've done very, very well with it. Um, and since then, it's just been a, here's, here's a credit card and go to town. Um, the nice thing is she shops here at work instead of shopping as much at home because she's worn out by it, um, which is great. <laughs> uh, my, when my dad started purchasing, right. uh, it was the same thing. It's don't try to buy something that you have no interest in. I would be right. terrible at buying women's clothing or purses or something that just completely is uninteresting to me. Right. And I'm, it's ultimately going to lead to failure um, because you're not going to put your, you know, a hundred percent into it yeah. where she likes buying pet stuff and she likes buying kitchen goods. She yeah. likes cooking. 
and does exceptionally well at mm. finding those And she products. probably knows a lot about it, so whatever it is, so she, so, yeah. She'll, but you still learn. You're always learning. If mm. you're not willing to learn or at least listening um, to what other people are telling you, mm-hmm. you don't have to read into it as if it's you know, gospel or anything. But you have to have an open mind. Otherwise, you're, you're really just losing out on that free information, yeah. um, whether it be from vendors, customers, anyone. It's, uh, the information that you can get for free from listening to people is well beyond what you can get from just Googling something a lot of times. So what would you say... Out of mistakes to avoid, what would you say the biggest mistake was throughout the years that you or the company made as far as product goes? Um, the biggest mistake we made as a company, um, as, a, as a company, business decision, uh, was we figured a number of years back that we would buy some property. We were growing out of what we had at the time. Hmm. We bought a dirt lot. We're going to build a building because in this town, there's not a lot of commercial warehousing. Mm -hmm. Um, There's not much at all. So we were going to build something. It was at the time going to be 22,000 square feet. Wow. Um, wow, That's that's going to be what gets us to retirement. You know, that'll last us forever. Um, Fortunately, we didn't, we didn't go through with it. Um, We ended up saying the cost to build was, yeah, it was, more it was significantly more than we paid for our current warehouse mm. um per square foot um and the building that we're in is in a multi-unit complex so we have our store that's on the front of the building uh it's you know the corner of the entire building on the street side which gives us some great retail frontage um on one of the main not thoroughfares but it's in a a pretty populated area still mm-hmm. near the residential district um and there's 16 units in this building, so if we need more space, all we got to do is go buy another. Right. Um, and we can take little nibbles as we get bigger mm-hmm. instead of having to relocate and buy a whole other warehouse. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, the building that we're in now is starting to become harder to acquire space in. Uh, so we're, we're back to that kind of balancing. How do we, how do we continue to grow? Yeah. Um, without having a lot of space, but it costs a lot of money. We still own that dirt lot. Oh, you do? Um, we still do. We, we haven't sold it. We've tried to sell it. Um, we paid for an engineer, an architect, all those prints to be drawn up, and it was an expensive uh, learning experience, yeah. uh, the most expensive learning experience we've had in this business. Yeah. It could have been more expensive if you ended up you yeah. know, building the building, though. <laughs> Yeah, we were fortunate to to know let's get out, and uh, that saved us a lot, you know, millions of dollars. Yeah. So. so this is interesting, Tom. So I didn't know you have a storefront. What was the decision? What made you decide to have the store and the warehouse and the offices? Um, we've always always had a store. My parents mm. actually owned a brick and mortar retail oh. uh, store together uh, before my dad jumped into this business. Gotcha. Um, that. It's having a store, you know, opens a lot of opportunity uh, for you. Brick and mortar retail is is not a, a huge part of our business, but it allows us to service customers locally. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think as you as you grow, just being an online retailer becomes something you you can't do. You cannot just be a brick and mortar retailer and get to a, a real large scale because they're a dime a dozen. Yeah. You know, you need to you need to be servicing customers, not just selling to customers. Right. Uh, you know, if if you just sell on eBay and you have no customer service and you just tell tell all your customers that I don't care if you have any questions, go ask somebody else and then buy from me. Um, it's not going to happen. Yeah. You're going to have a real tough time uh, scaling. Yeah. So, Tom, what has worked? the best in the beginning and what works the best now as far as increasing sales? Um, it's, it's all about, you've got to have a catalog, a good catalog. Um, you know, there's nothing that 
will get around having good products. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can you can have a hundred thousand of the world's worst pro- worst selling products. Not that they're bad, but the worst selling products, and your business is destined to have struggles. Where if you have five hundred of the top five hundred sellers on Amazon, you're gonna be minting money like there's no tomorrow. Um, so you definitely want to pick those right items and something that there's a cohesiveness to. Um, there's some people that just sell random this, this, and this. Yeah. Uh, and we, we do sell a lot of, you know, somewhat seemingly random stuff, but we try to keep everything in a, like a normal school of thought. Yeah. We sell kitchen goods. We sell yeah, our- you do a good job actually, you know, kind of breaking it when I was looking at it into categories. Right, you have like the health category, the beauty category, the home and kitchen category, so it doesn't seem as random because you kind of got it segmented. Yeah, um, and you could almost put names of people who purchase a lot of that stuff above them. My wife does very, very well with the mm. uh, the baby stuff. Don't have kids, don't you know? <laughs> uh, I, I'm not going to get entertained by buying a lot of baby stuff, but she does. Um, <laughs> And that's, you know, that essentially anything that is baby is purchased by her because mm-hmm. she likes, um, mm-hmm. I would get bored to tears by, yeah. you know, just looking at baby stuff because I don't understand it, which is where having a, a really good team of people right. that you can rely on, uh, is critical to getting to a business to this scale. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, you can run an e-commerce business at a small scale with just a few people. Um, but we're doing a million five, one point five a year um, in orders. You, you can't do that hypothetically, just selling vacuum bags. So um, what's your favorite category, personally? Um, you know, it's for me, I've tried to disassociate myself a lot with the products because there's a lot of other stuff that I do with the business now mm-hmm. that I did three years ago when I was growing catalog. Yeah. Uh, it's become more of what do I, who do I like buying from? Mm. Uh, and who do I, who do I want to pick up the phone and call and talk to or send an email to? And that's having those relationships uh, make it a lot easier than just liking the product. Cause yeah. it's, you know, I, I don't like buying vacuum bags for the sake of buying vacuum bags. I like buying vacuum bags, which is the category that you know I buy, right. uh, or one of the categories that I buy. I like buying them because I like the the people that I deal with on a consistent basis mm-hmm. uh, when I'm buying them. Yeah. So if you know, if all of a sudden I had to switch vendors or switch you know sales reps or something like that, yeah. it would be a a whole lot more tedious. Uh, to come into work and try to buy that product. Yeah. Uh, I buy the sports nutrition products in our account, and it's the same thing. I enjoy dealing with those sales reps and those people with that company. Mm-hmm. So it makes it easier, uh, for me at least. But yeah. there's a lot. Yeah. So tell, me, tell me this in the beginning. Let's go back to the beginning for a second. Early on, what was a big influence for you? Your parents had what kind of store when you were growing up? They uh, ran a, a vacuum retailer. Oh, they did? Uh, brick and mortar vacuum store, which is how, essentially, how I got a foot in the door. Um, real similar to Chad. Yeah, uh, it's so funny. It's like it, exactly the same. There's a lot of weird similarities yeah. between uh, our stories. But we had never met or anything. Uh, but my parents had a brick and mortar retailer for vacuum stuff they had for a number of years and when I had lost my job uh, as a financial advisor um, stock market went down it just went to crap uh, and I was like I need I need a job I me and my wife are getting married uh, recently married and had to pay the bills had to keep yeah. food on the table so it was let me go apply for some jobs during the day and when I get home uh, let me sell something online Mm. and they were, you know, a couple hundred miles away. I contacted their supplier that they did because they didn't care. I was just going to sell it on eBay. 
What made you decide to sell it online? You could have just been like, I'm just going to apply to jobs and never think about selling it online. When I was in high school, I sold some of their stuff uh, online. They would take trade-ins for uh, vacuum cleaners. Mm -hmm. They sold somebody a new one. Hey, yeah. we'll give you 50 bucks off if you trade in that, uh, that old one that you have here. Uh, and I would take them, I'd clean them up, and I'd sell them on eBay as a high school job. Mm. Uh, at the time, you, you still can do that, but you could do that pretty easy as a high school kid. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my first real experience with online retail was a ways ago, you know, maybe 15, 18 years ago. So that's stuck in your head at the time. Yeah. I knew that I could make some money. Um, it might not have been enough to, to pay all the bills, but at least I was contributing to, you know, our newly formed household when mm. we were just there. And even though we didn't take anything out, I still felt like, okay, at some point we can just sell all this inventory off and then we can, you know, maybe pay the mortgage one month or pay the car payment, mm -hmm. or whatever it may be. And we were fortunate enough at the time that my wife could, you know, sustain us as a family. Um, and we're very, we don't do a lot. Not big spenders. Yeah. yeah you know, they're, they're, they have our dog and we, you know, have our, our TV and, just hang out and, you know, enjoy that. Yeah, more so, so, you know, Tom, I want to hear about the early days when you started selling online after the financial, it, you know, uh, crisis. But um, go back. What did you learn from your parents growing up? You know, because you uh, saw them running in the entrepreneurs <laughs> and running a store. What, did you, what, uh, what was it like? What are you laughing about? There's a good story here. Um, there's, yeah, there's a lot of good stories of that one. Um, when... My parents ran their store. I, my dad would go out and he would, he was a vac, you know, your, your vacuum cleaner salesman. Right. Um, you know, they had a, a store that they sold out of, but it was never, you know, it was never a lot of money, let's say. Um, and he worked really hard, um, really, really hard to support, you know, the family as we were growing up. And I was like, I'm like, I don't want to, I'm not going to go into that family business, um, and do that. I, I'm not. So I tried a couple months, uh, tried working with him after yeah. losing my job and I, 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 I hated it. Why? I like, I would, What's it in your life? Um, it was, you're there trying to sell people something and I've never liked high pressure sales. Mm-hmm. I want to buy something at the store and I have a question about it, I'll ask you. If I'm there looking at, you know, something, just browsing around, I don't need a salesperson coming to me telling me that I need to buy this because their, you know, commission depends on it. So online sales is really low pressure. You can do it from the, you know, from the couch. With no pressure. <laughs> yeah. I'm not pressuring people to buy anything. And it's if you want something buy it from me um you know what did you learn from your parents about selling um because you can translate that selling in person to online too right yeah you might um i don't know if it was more the selling as the running a business that i got from them okay um i don't feel like i'm a great salesperson yeah um if I was, I probably would have liked it and mm -hmm. been really good at it, and this business wouldn't exist. Um, so what you, yeah, what did you learn about running the business side of um, That I never really wanted to work for the man of sorts. I, I wanted to be able to reap the benefits of doing a really good job, because I feel like I work pretty hard, and you know, I'm working 60, 70 hours a week still, um, that I don't want to just you make, you know, 10 bucks an hour, or 12 bucks an hour if I'm really, really good at something because it makes me work harder at it. Mm -hmm. And the harder my parents worked at selling stuff, the more they made. And I saw that, mm -hmm. um, you know, and not that they did a, you know, a bad job running a business, but I learned a lot of things, how we do things differently than how they did things. Um, one of the biggest was reinvest in the business and grow it because 
if you have a bad month or two, you still want to be able to be growing that business, taking steps forward and forward mm-hmm. and forward. It might not be as big of a step, but if you're taking out 100% of your profits or anywhere close to it, yeah. that growing that business the next month is immensely harder than getting to, you know, getting to be able to grow it as you're taking out all that money um, just to pay your bills yeah. on a monthly basis that, yeah. um, you know, they, they closed their business down when this business started taking, you know, real paychecks, uh, regular paychecks and, you know, enough to sustain life as a human being. Right. Uh, and I'm happy about that. You know, they've, they've done well uh, for themselves owning this business instead of that one. Um, so what, it, um, what was it like? So you started off then selling, you come home for your job or searching for jobs and you start selling in the evening. What yep. was next? What, what progressed, uh, what it progressed to? Um, I ended up as the business was kind of growing, I ended up getting a job and I worked, um, in, we lived in Henderson, uh, right outside Las Vegas and I worked at a casino. Oh, and really? What'd you do? I, uh, initially started in a sports book and then ended up working in a poker room. Okay. Uh, and worked in a poker room for a while while this business grew. Mm. And I, I was very fortunate uh, to have that um, that experience. Taught me a lot about calculated risk. And yeah, tell me about it. What did you learn from watching poker players? Um, really, it's you know there's a cost benefit analysis that you do as a good poker player, and you can take risks, take gambles. Um, if you can afford to lose, you know, something and know that what you're doing is going to work out for the best in the long run. Cause it's not like you're playing blackjack. I didn't, if I worked as a blackjack dealer, I would, you know, just know not to gamble. <laughs> <laughs> but as a poker player, there was consistently people winning yeah. and I played a lot of poker as a poker dealer. Mm. Um, and one of the, really the biggest things that happened was as I was working as a poker dealer um, near the end of that part of my life, uh, I had a boss who was a friend as well, uh, and I started at five days a week, and I, went, I asked him, hey, I'm having to work so much. I'm getting off work, and I'm going home, and I'm working until 3, 4 in the morning. Um, I've got I've to get a break. Can I go down to four days? Um, and went down to three days, went down to two days. And then it got to be that I would show up for work and I would eat lunch or breakfast or whatever time I got in. And they would be like, hey, we're, we're slow today. Does anybody want to go home? And I'd be like, right here. I, you know, I worked for half an hour. All I did was eat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he pulled me into his office and he said, Tom, uh, you've got to, to think about what you're doing because clearly you don't need to be here. And that was the real tipping point mm. of, you know, somebody not firing me. Cause, sure, if you want to come in and when we need you, you we're not letting you go. But uh, said, you don't need to be here. This is no longer your job. This is just, you're here because you're friends with the people here and you like it when you're here. But mm-hmm. if you want to be here, just come play poker someday. Yeah. I, I, I wish I could reconnect with him uh, because... He, uh, I, it was a great experience. Um, just ha- being told, stop showing up for work and do do right. this. It was, right. a, you know, it yeah. paid off many dividends. So I want to hear about what you were doing to grow the business during that time. But I have to ask, what's your favorite poker room story? Um, you know, there's. I used to play on the clock um, when things were slow. And they would, they still do, you know, if you're a poker dealer in Vegas, they'll let you play on the clock if it's to get a game started and so forth. Hmm. And there's not really a a specific story of sorts, but when things were slow, personally, um, I, you know, helped pay our bills playing poker. Hmm. Uh, You know, it's, I guess, a little known fact, but we, uh, Every year at the one of the trade shows, they have a charity poker event, and I think three of the four years I've come in the top, I think four. Right. 
out of a, a bunch of people. So it's, it's a lot of fun. I still enjoy it, but um, we live an hour away from a casino, and I, I'm i usually at work, so I don't get the chance to play as often as I would. I figured you were like, oh, I went head-to-head with... Uh Michael Jordan when he came in Vegas or something. <laughs> no, nothing. You know, at the time I was, you know, had enough to play, but not enough to, to get in trouble. So what were you doing to grow the business during that time so that you can go from five? Because, I mean, someone listening may be in the same situation. They want to go from five days to four to the boss yeah. saying, you don't need to show up anymore. What were you doing to grow the business? Um, we constantly reinvested in inventory because mm-hmm. it, at first we had only bought a little bit. Um, of inventory and we were you know you sell five hundred dollars and you made a hundred bucks you buy six hundred dollars and you can't buy just six hundred dollars of that same product Um, some products you can but it was really growing skew count we started with maybe a a dozen or two skews Mm -hmm. Um, and just instead of buying just the Hoover vacuum bags buy the Dyson filters and buy the Bissell bags and whatever other items it was until you uh, get a, a sizable catalog because mm-hmm. anybody can sell 10 SKUs. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's getting to the you know, thousands of SKUs that a lot of kind of the, the smaller and mid-sized sellers now have to be a sustainable business. Mm-hmm. A meaningful, you know, not that small sellers aren't a meaningful business, but something that was enough for us to pay our bills mm-hmm. um, and quit our job, quit our day jobs. So at um, what point do you have a certain formula? Like we want to get a new SKU every two weeks or month in that early stages. How fast did you want to grow or did you see it sustainable to grow? At the beginning, yeah. uh, it was just grow as fast as you can. Just as when you, when you're buying inventory, I would say, okay. And I would call them up on the phone. I'd roll through what I needed for inventory, and I'd say, how much does that add up to be? And I knew what the balance was in our account mm-hmm. at the time. And I would say, your, your balance, your, what you owe us today is $5,000, and I had $6,000 in the account. And we didn't have other expenses because we were operating out of the house. And I'd mm-hmm. say, let me know when we get to six then. And I'd spend the other 1000 on product. Right. Um, and we would sell it, and I'd call them up you know, a week or two later, and say, you know, I've got seven. I'm going to order what I need and do the same thing over again. It's a bit different now as we're large because we're not spending everything that we have because uh, there's other expenses to have to cover. Right. But the formula is still the same. Uh, it's grow as much as you can, as fast as you can, mm-hmm. because if you're not growing, you're shrinking. And that's I say that all the time here uh, to business people that we deal with to vendors to our employees is if we do the same thing that we did the past 12 months we're shrinking actually because somebody else is getting bigger than us the the world of e-commerce is growing Mm -hmm. at 15 percent a year and if we're growing any less than that 15 percent a year somebody else is kicking our butt and we're just taking it because we want to do the same thing we did a year ago um and a lot of people just get to a point of being okay, not realizing that really sooner or later your your market share, even if it's just a sliver of what the real market is, is actually shrinking as more more and more people are buying online. Yeah. Um, what was working at that time for you to get through inventory quicker? What works? Um, a lot of times, as we you know, when times are needed. We've built a, a program uh, for our inventory uh, management and how much we buy and so forth. And we can say, okay, instead of having 90 days worth of inventory or 78 days worth of inventory, you can shave it down uh, to, okay, we're only going to hold 27 days worth of inventory or something smaller. So you have more capital and you can grow that catalog really fast mm-hmm. by holding less days of inventory because you still have the same amount of money to to buy Mm -hmm. uh goods with so shrink it down to you know 30 days instead of 90 take the other 60 days that you now sold off of everything else and 
go buy 2,000 new SKUs. Um, see how those do. And then when you start building things back up, and it's, it's over a year period of time. During fourth quarter, you're not buying a lot of new stuff. Um, you're typically concentrating on just getting as much of everything that you sell in-house and being able to afford it. So that way when come you know Black Friday and all of a sudden you sell a thousand of something, um, you're not you didn't only sell five hundred because that's all you bought, but that's all you you know could afford. Mm-hmm. Uh, then come you know January, it's let's buy twenty five hundred new SKUs. Let's you know for us it's it's more than that now, uh, but it's catalog growth because we sell you know somewhere in the fourteen thousand SKU range right now. Yeah. Uh, how do we get from those 14,000 SKUs this year, if we want to grow up 40%, we probably need to get to somewhere in the, you know, what, 30,000 range by next year uh, at this time uh, to continue our, our trajectory. That's, that's a lot of SKUs. It's a lot of SKUs. Yeah. yeah. A couple of things come up around that time. One. Sorry. It would actually be like 20, 21, 22. Sorry. But. Yeah. I, a couple of things that. come up. One is. The breakdown, um, what do you, would you tell people about having your own brand versus selling other known brands? We've taken the approach of not being, not selling our own brand, not going to a, like a China, which is where most stuff comes from these days. Yeah. Um, not everything, but uh, not saying we're going to import a, a filter. Uh, a, a vacuum bag, whatever it may be, and put our name on it, because there's a lot of really well-established brands out there that we can buy, and we're not, we don't have as much risk of sorts of saying, let's bring in a container of goods um, for an unproven brand that we call it the Our Pampered Home widgets. Mm-hmm. Um, we could, you know, at this point we're at a scale where that probably wouldn't be really difficult but we you know why not just if we're going to bring in glass kitchen glasses or mixers or something like that why not just go with the you know the well-known home run hitters the you know Rito glassware Lennox or Waterford or something along those lines Mm -hmm. and uh, there's no need for us to try to recreate the wheel Uh, we're giving customers those specialty brands that we sell um and not, you know, if we tried to sell KitchenAid mix or our version of a KitchenAid mixer, yeah. KitchenAid would squash us. Um, so why, why try to compete? Even, you know, we've just never, never thought the, the need would arise for us right. in that. And I know other people have and done well with it. Um, but it's not our, not our special. I always like to hear both sides of that. Why some, you know, because I know people do, people don't. Yeah. So that, you know, that makes sense. And then what about, okay, software wise, what kind of software do you use? What kind of tools? Because you say, okay, we need to add 10,000 SKUs of something. Mm-hmm. You have someone has to, or somehow it has to get entered onto your website, onto Amazon, onto all these other platforms. Uh, if you were to see our browser history on, you know, just random stuff that we're looking for, it would be mind boggling. Um, it's nonstop between myself, my wife, my dad, who are really looking for some of those brands and going to trade shows, Mm -hmm. go to trade shows all the time to find products. Um, but as far as software goes, our software that we use, Google Chrome, Microsoft Excel, and Microsoft Outlook for email. That's our, our powerhouse of what we use every day. Um, we are a, a customer of a software platform for getting stuff out there um, and warehouse management, but uh, it's, not, it's not critical to finding product. Really, mm-hmm. it's, there's a, a lot of feel for it. Um, going through looking at, if you want to sell, you want to sell you know, vac- if you want to be a vacuum bag seller, um, and there's a, a number of them out there, you have to know what you're looking for because um, you can't go sell the brand that 
doesn't do well, mm -hmm. um, and there's a couple, you want to go for the, you know, the stuff that you're going to be able to turn inventory instead of selling a few a year. Mm -hmm. that, that's a tough sell um, mm -hmm. in that sense, too. Um, but it's a lot of just browsing online, finding brands, mm -hmm. listening to what your customers tell you, and talking mm -hmm. to your customers, talking yeah. to your, your customer service people, saying, hey, what has somebody asked for? You know, did somebody say, hey, do you have a widget? Um, and do you have that widget? And when they tell them no, that's, a, that's key information right there because mm -hmm. somebody wants to buy it. Right. So why can't we sell it? Right? So what, um, what have you done differently because you listened to your customers, whether it was a certain product or category? Um. You know, we we really, in the beginning, were very home and kitchen, uh, whether it be vacuums, whether it be mixers, whether it be small appliances, glassware, tabletop, um, those type categories, and going into stuff, why don't you sell baby stuff? Well, we didn't sell baby stuff because it didn't occur. Um, at the time. So we've expanded into that. Why didn't you sell toys? Well, we didn't know where to buy them. Um, and you're really, you have to have a good buyer, a good, you know, or multiple buyers, purchasers of people who are looking at the products, looking at what vendors sell and listen to your sales reps too. Um, because they know what sells, you know, Absolutely, absolutely, and you have to trust your sales rep too. Yeah. You don't just buy what they're, you know, getting a huge commission on because right. they want a, you know, a new car. <laughs> uh, you have to build that trust right. over a long period of time, especially when you're putting, you know, your livelihood at risk. Because I don't need, you know, a thousand blenders. You know, I can't send them to my electric company and say, "Here's blenders for my electric bill." Right. Uh, so. You know, listen, listen to everything around you. Listen to your customers who say, I want this brand baby carrier or stroller or something like that. Listen to this person who says, hey, why don't you sell this pet toy? Or, you know, this person who says, hey, I, this new vacuum cleaner, I've heard about it. Do you sell parts for it? Probably not yet, but I'm going to try to find out if I can mm -hmm. and, and grow your catalog that way. Mm -hmm. So, Tom, what about... Not software finding products. What about just like whether they're entering them into, you know, one of the your your website or Amazon or wherever? What or any tools you use just to run the business software wise? We do so much of that manually. Really? Uh, yeah. We've. I don't know how you do that with like uh, ten thousand SKUs. Yeah. Everything has been done manually. We have. Wow. We don't do at least for Amazon. We don't do data feeds. Um, and there's reasons behind it because we want to make sure that when we're putting in a specific SKU, that it's it matches the detail page on that website, that we're not just trusting that whoever created that detail page on Rakuten, mm -hmm. which is notoriously, you know, I'm not throwing them under the bus, but yeah, they're bad mm -hmm. at their data feed. Um, if you do a data feed to them just by what you think is the correct information and somebody else said that, hey, they took the, the UPC number for the vacuum bags and put all the pictures and details and so forth to the vacuum cleaner. You're going to get a customer who buys the vacuum cleaner for 20 bucks, and you send them the bags, which you think is correct, and mm. you now have a customer wanting a $800 vacuum cleaner that they knew was wrong, but they're trying to beat you out of it. Right. On Amazon, we don't have that. Uh, because we put in everything yeah. manual to get it right. And our yeah. customers, we have 100% uh, positive feedback over the past 365 days on Amazon. Uh, with that volume, that's it's it's a lot amazing. Of yeah. yeah, it's a lot of manual work to get there. Yeah. Uh, and we've always done it that way, and I don't think that will change. Um, you know, we, we now have people to help us with it, because it used to be just me, my dad, and my wife, who right. would put stuff in. Yeah. And now we have, you know, essentially assistants and helpers to, to mm -hmm. help us with that. Yeah. But even when, you know, up to about a year ago, we did it all manually. 
uh, ourselves. So, so uh, nothing wrong with it. no, I think it's amazing. I was just thinking, how do you even begin to, to do that? I mean, you probably have like 10 people entering in SKUs or something. But um, so you go from selling the vacuum bags and cleaners and parts and growing. So what was the next category that you decided to, to go into? Um, the next with, with me uh, purchasing, when I was still doing all the purchasing uh, myself, uh, was sports nutrition. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, your proteins, your pre-workouts, your uh, stuff like that. And it was for no other reason other than I just kind of, I was going to the gym, obviously not anymore. <laughs> uh, but I was like, hey, you know what, why can't we sell this stuff? Mm -hmm. And found a vendor. Um, and I still deal with that same sales rep today that I did, you know, for the past seven years. Yeah. Um, and I've, we're we're good friends at this point. We've talked, you know, pretty much daily for years. Yeah. Uh, but uh, in the beginning, he's just like, you're, you're just a crazy dude who thinks he can run, you know, a supplement business like everybody else that calls me up. And at the time, that, that was the case. We, you know, we probably shouldn't have entered that market. But Why not? Yeah. Uh, it's that, that product is one of the hardest to purchase because your price is never the same. Really? You're, what you buy it for today, it's really weird. And you have to be very good at math and, you know, figuring out what your landed cost is for something. Because you may buy three of product X and they're going to give you a product Y as like a promo unit. And you're going to lose money if you just sell product X. Hmm. So you have to assign a value that you're going to sell product Y for and know you're going to sell product Y to be able to make your money. Um, because you'll never make money just selling product X. And so they give you a bonus product if you buy certain products? In, or In the supplement industry, sports nutrition, supplement industry, pretty much everything is a buy, buy three, get one, buy four, get one, I buy see. five, get one, buy 11, get one. Um, and I think they do it honestly. So that way, instead of just buying one <laughs> of everything, you right. have to step up and buy 11 right. or whatever it may be. Yeah. Uh, to get that kind of some real volume there, and you're not just yeah you know, just buying one of everything mm -hmm. uh, to get your SKU count up. But it that's a tougher one because you have to be very very careful of your landed cost and competing against some of the other sellers mm -hmm. uh, who honestly I I am curious some days how they're making money um because i you know we fight for the best price that we can get right and uh if i wasn't the one purchasing i wouldn't just trust somebody else to to try to bring in that product you have to be very very careful mm -hmm. um and we've had some really big you know big losses it also expires if you're not going to sell it fast right. uh, and know that you're going to sell it fast the worst thing that you can have is something that says expired on. <laughs> right. It's not like a vacuum bag filter that yeah. will never go bad. Yeah. Yeah. If it, you know, if it's a food item or a, you know, something that does expire, uh, and you get stuck with it, they're paperweights. Um, they're not even good paperweights. They're trash. Uh, and you can lose a lot of money. Um, and we have, you know, we've had some big, uh, big losses there, uh, that, we've you know we've done fine with but they're never you never want to lose on anything right so what's your research process like at i can imagine because especially with let's say you're working out there's a million different types of proteins or you know protein powder and this and that how how did you decide to evaluate okay we're going with this company and this product the uh that was at the time listening to to the sales rep in the very beginning even before i trusted him mm -hmm. uh like i do now uh it was what what do you have a great deal on that you think i could really do well with mm -hmm. and research it the same way we do vacuum bags you know you look it up you see what the reviews are are the, is it getting good reviews bad reviews how long has it been out um you know where's your you know 
where does it kind of fit on Amazon? If you Google it, is there 20 other things that come up before it mm-hmm. that, you know, it's buried on the third of the search results? Um, there's lots of little little things here mm-hmm. and there that you're, uh, you're looking at. You know, what's the sales rank on it? Is, mm-hmm. it? is your sales rank on it number one? Is it the number one item on Amazon? I think that's the Kindle, but... You know, anyway, is it the number one in protein powders? Right. Um, Because if it is, you might have a shot uh, of moving quite a bit of volume. If it's number 300,000 in whatever, in sports nutrition, you're going to have a bad time. Mm -hmm. Have a real bad time. Uh, And you you might want to think about just taking it yourself. Um, (laughs) And it's just kind of stuck. The same process works for everything. It just whether it's sports nutrition or vacuum bags or baby carriers, you're looking at all the same information and mm-hmm. making those fine calculations in your head on the fly a lot of times of I want two of those or I want 60 of those. Um, and it, you just you learn it. It's a learned skill mm-hmm. uh, of doing it a lot of times. But in the beginning, you do have to be really cautious until you have that, that skill set. Yeah. So um, how do you compete? Because... As you say, like with you are, if someone's selling known brands, you can go on and let's say there's 30 other people selling these vacuum cleaners or whatever it is. What are some things that people can do to compete so that people are actually buying from them and not the 50 other people selling the same thing? Ooh. Um, you know, there, there's. If you're just taking a. a a vacuum bag and saying, I want to sell a brand A vacuum bag and there's brand B, C, and D also listed and you all of a sudden want that to be selling better. Um, there's some tricks to it. Um, it's, <laughs> it's a definite fine line of what I would want to, to go into. Right. Um, I like hitting these fine lines. So what can you share about competing with other sellers with the same brand that won't give away any of your secret the same, sauce. The same brand. Same uh, brand. If, if it's the, if we're all selling the same thing. Yes. Uh, the the number one thing is you can defeat Amazon's buy box with price. You sell something for five bucks cheaper on a ten dollar item, mm-hmm. and you're able to ship it next day. You can probably get the buy box, and you can mm-hmm. probably. Sell you can lose a lot of money too though you could Um, you know we are a very large FBA seller we do a lot through fulfillment by Amazon yeah because we do you know we'll do somewhere in the 1.5 million orders this year range shipping those all out of here yeah we our staff we have somewhere in the high 30s of staff Um, if we were to ship all those orders to individual customers and pack them and so forth and label everything to every individual customer. Um, that, uh, that's a lot more than just 30 people doing it. Um, yeah. so we, we use that as a, we also don't have the space for it, um, to stock all the, if we took everything back that we have, uh, in third party warehouses, mm-hmm. we wouldn't, have room for it um unfortunately so fba price um definitely when you're a small seller and you don't have a lot of reviews it's harder Mm -hmm. um people some people like to to buy from the little guy and give him a fair chance and so forth but i know myself i'm looking for who has you know 100 Mm percent feedback and it's a lot of feedback, you know that they've done a lot of orders, yeah. that you know, if I want a TV, I, I go to, you know, Amazon. I go to Amazon now. Beforehand, when Amazon didn't exist, I'd go to Best Buy. Right. Um, because they were big, and I, I trusted them. Uh, I don't go to, you know, the guy selling it out of the back of his van. <laughs> 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 you know? Right? Uh, you can, of course, yeah. So... Uh, it's the same concept online. Yeah. Uh, you know, where do you where do you think of when you want to buy most stuff nowadays? Is is Amazon? Forty um, percent. You know, yeah, about forty percent of product searches start on Amazon. Um, so if you're not there, you're 
you're having a tough issue with relevance for your brand. Um, How do you decide whether to keep it in-house and ship it or ship it all FBA? Um, there, there's not much that we ship out of here um, to customers for Amazon. So if it's an Amazon item, um, we'll FBA at 99 plus percent of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, because they'll handle the, the shipping, they'll handle the returns, they'll handle mm-hmm. if it's late, the customer can call Amazon. And they can call Amazon 24 hours a day. Right. Um, which for us is great. Uh, and Amazon shipping rates are awesome. You know, any, you know, real, even small seller, they can see what it costs to ship. Compare that to your own UPS rates and your jaw is going to drop. Mm-hmm. It's, it's awesome. Um, you know, not as a plug for Amazon or anything, but their rates with whoever they ship with. They can compete, yeah. Yeah. Um, They have buying power or whatever it is, yeah. Yeah, their UPS rate has got to be just ridiculously low to to be doing that. So Um, why ship anything out of a warehouse? um, Well, if we're shipping to customers on our website, if we're shipping internationally um, and so forth, and we want to control that customer experience, Mm -hmm. um, we stock, you know, we have our warehouse that we stock everything in as well. Um, so that way we can service international customers, customers for a, you know, a web platform that might not want you to, um, to be having a box show up from Amazon that, you know, has a big old smile on the side of it and they bought it on eBay or Newegg or something mm-hmm. like that. We can still ship those. Um, so that way we're not just blasting it out in front of customers' faces that they, if you bought on Newegg, but <laughs> Amazon shipped it to you. Um, so that's, that's the reasoning behind it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, as we get bigger, having control over our own website and so yeah. forth is, is needed. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing, Tom, is how do you diversify? I mean, a lot of the sellers I talk to, they have a large percentage on Amazon. How can, what advice do you have for people to diversify and, and what tips, whether it's your, you know, maybe start with your personal site, um, you know, rpamperedhome.com or eBay or any other platforms. Um, what do you recommend? Uh, you need a good warehouse management system. Mm-hmm. And I've talked with Chad about Scubana mm-hmm. uh, a lot. And I've, I've seen it from its infancy grow into what it is now. Yeah. And I'm really, I'm happy with what Chad has done. Yeah. You know, not as a... And for full disclosure, we are not a Scubana customer, but I can say that their software is great. Um, what did we, you like about? What did you think was good? Um, for for where it's at now, it doesn't do everything that the the largest guy out there does. Um, that is a competitor of theirs. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if you want to put it out there, but we're a channel advisor customer. Is it uh, just that that's a lot more expensive, or why do people not go with it? A channel advisor. A channel advisor. Is that, what, is that the we're, difference? We're channel, we, if we tried to be a channel advisor customer um, when we were real small, it would have been extremely expensive. Yeah. Uh, is their minimum per month for a small seller is pretty sizable. Yeah. Um, and we looked into channel advisor before we became a customer years later, actually. Um, and we couldn't fade that monthly bill, um, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, is cheaper. Um, from a, a entry level, you can, they're, you're paying per order. Um, I like the, their interface. It's all cloud-based and so forth. Um, for everything that we do here, for all our ordering and so forth, I have a custom computer built under here. Um, that runs all the software because it'll, you put it on just a, mm. a cheap $200 computer and it'll smoke that computer. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. You'll be sitting, you know, you can go do the dishes while you're waiting for spreadsheet calculations to happen. Wow. Um, you know, I, I love the computer I use. It's great. Um, but not everybody wants to have that system and the computing power in the cloud that Scubana mm. has access to is, is great. 
um, there's the reason why we're a channel advisor customer is we're actually a managed client of theirs. So they do a lot of the kind of back end stuff with us that we wouldn't do ourselves a mm-hmm. lot of times. They're they're a big help there for us, but it comes at a huge price. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so at what point, I'm sure you and Chad have had this conversation and yeah. is interested because um, for sales purposes and, and for sellers purposes, what, I'm sure you've had this conversation and he's like, what would it take for you to become a Scubana customer? Or switch, is it just too big of a pain because you're such a big seller or what? Um, there's a, yeah, there's some definite work there. We're, we're the, the biggest, re- we're in contract with Channel Advisor. Mm-hmm. Um, we're in a, you know, a, not long term, but we're in a contract yeah. with them. Um, so even if I switch, I'm still paying them, and then I'm going to pay, pay both. Yeah. <laughs> which gets expensive. Um, I always we, like, and this is not a commercial, obviously, you know, Scubana sponsors this, but it's not a commercial for any one vendor, but I always want to know, like, what is it in the head of the founder that would make him switch or, you know, stay the, you know, stay the same? Um, you know, if, they do a lot of things that we have put together a lot of pieces of software ourselves over the years to do. Um, But if we were much smaller uh, than we are, and we were still trying to build these pieces of information, having them now at just one site at Mm -hmm. one company um, would have saved me so many hours of building out spreadsheets and ordering you know, programs and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I've given Skubana, I've talked to Chad uh, over the phone very candidly about this is what I think your Mm -hmm. software should do because this Mm -hmm. is what we do. Right. And if you can have, you know, somebody build this in, it helps us so much Mm -hmm. that you just have to, you know, have one of your programmers do what I did. And it's... Like hack together different solutions that work for you. So this is interesting, you know, it's nothing like, Tom, learning from people and talking to people in the trenches. And, and you and Chad, they've started around the same time and have, have grown to today. What good advice have come out of your conversations with him? Oh, man. Um, in the beginning, when we were direct competitors. Right, because that's the other <laughs> thing. Is we, you guys sold and were direct competitors. Yeah. yeah, you could you could split screen this um, from, uh, you know, six seven years ago um, when we were both much smaller, kind of growing, and you'd be bleeping out most of this conversation <laughs> because we we weren't uh, we were both small and at the time direct competitors selling in the same listings, the same everything, right. and. Uh, it got to be, once Chad stepped into brand new, branding his own products, um, that there wasn't that direct competition in a listing mm-hmm. competing for the buy box. He's competing for his brand, and we're selling a different brand. Yeah. Um, and were you just sitting there, Tom, and you'd be like just swearing at the screen <laughs> and hate having his picture or his company name on the dartboard? <laughs> I mean. You now, didn't know each other at the time, but you, you knew talked, of each other. We had talked over the phone. Oh, you had? Uh, yeah, we had spoken at some trade shows okay. in the beginning. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, we weren't going out to dinner together or anything like that. <laughs> um, but at, when you're small and you're kind of fearful for your business, and it, it's, it's still my, you know, my, my child of sorts, and I, I'm still going to fight for it. Right. But I'm not as fearful of, we're small and we can't really make any missteps. We can't let somebody come in and, mm-hmm. you know, steal, steal our, our business, sell our products and so forth. Um, and it, uh, it was one of those, you don't want to, to ever let off the gas, um, and stop trying and, yeah, we. So, what were some we, of those early conversations that helped 
that you actually, you know, maybe something he said helped you or, or vice versa? Um, you know, we would, we would discuss kind of, we didn't really have great conversations until we got to be a little bit more sizable. Yeah. Um, yeah, tell me about one of those, yeah. Uh, you know, now, now a lot of it is in regards to where are we going next? Where are we expanding? So we can bounce ideas off of each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really feel like Chad and his company is growing into, uh, there's Crucial Vacuum, which does very well, and he's built that brand um, to what it is. And now I, I feel like a lot of his desire, and he could correct me if I'm wrong, um, and I wouldn't mind at all, is going into building Skubana. Uh, and he still has great information and great insight into the next marketplace, which marketplaces are doing well for him. And we, we converse about what's doing well mm -hmm. for us. You know, we're on, on jet and he had some real, uh, uh, maybe he had an opinion on, on jet before it launched. Mm -hmm. Um, I tend to think that his opinion was wrong. Uh, <laughs> You know, but it was really it's really hard to compete with Amazon. But I think yeah. Jet really kind of threw us both for a loop because we expected them to try to take on Amazon. And I feel like what Jet's doing is really trying to take on eBay, um, where people are, are really hungry for deals, mm -hmm. where Amazon, they're really hungry for great service and fast shipping. Mm -hmm. And everything's on there. There's not everything on Jet yet, but the price that you get there is you know, it's pretty good. Yeah. Um, you know, we've compared notes on product and, and so forth that products come and go. Um, he's asked why we do one thing versus another. Um, why, why do we branch out in, we used to go by a different seller name. Um, and we rebranded ourselves this year, um, to, to really kind of meet that, Specialty brand. So um, did you, did our pamper at home is just this year. Yeah. Oh January, wow. Um, January first, we we rebranded ourselves um, because we were, we're our company has grown so quick. Wow. I love that brand. Wow. Yeah, that's great. I had no idea. Uh, that, yeah. Kudos to my wife then. Yeah. So uh, what was it before? Uh, our online seller name was uh, More Quality, Less Money. That's just what it was when we were real small. Yeah. Um, and we transitioned Your to... Your wife gets just gold star. That's amazing. Yeah. She, our store has been Pampered Home Spoiled Family for a while. Okay. But try typing in Pampered Home Spoiled Family and you, <laughs> like, you're like, uh, squirrel. And you've already, you know, you typed in a couple <laughs> words of it. And you're, <laughs> you're like, no, Amazon's easier. But our Pampered Home uh, was shorter. Mm. It was available. Um, and we... Uh, we rebranded because mm -hmm. we're we're not going to sell every blender. We're not going to sell every set of glassware. We're going to sell the you know the stuff that Walmart isn't selling. You want the higher end stuff. Yeah, because yeah. we can't compete against Walmart selling you know solo cups. Yeah, you know. Uh, right. But we can compete against them selling a uh, KitchenAid mixer. Yeah. Or you know, a set of high-end glassware that they don't even offer mm -hmm. uh, this specialty, and that's yeah. that's a real our our bread and butter is stuff that isn't available from an Amazon, isn't available from a Walmart or a Best Buy or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been you know we've been successful with it. We've so Tom, happy. how do you then tell me about the best way to diversify? How do you get more sales from your website because everyone doesn't want to depend on Amazon. No. Um, what, what works as far as that goes? You've got to get your your products advertising out in front of people because SEO is a long-winded, very time-consuming process, right. which we still struggle with um, to get a lot of natural search traffic. Yeah. But oddly enough, and we can see through Google Analytics and so forth, how many people search for our brand and come straight from Amazon hmm. um, and come straight from eBay and come straight from Newegg to our site and purchase something there. Mm -hmm. that some people maybe don't have Prime or maybe they, you know, they don't want to shop on eBay, but that's where Google took them to. 
um, they see that we sell it, they come to our site, they buy it. Uh, but as far as getting people to your website, you cannot beat Google. You know, has anybody used a different search engine today? Right. Uh, there's some. Yeah. But, you know, Google, Google Shopping, their PLAs. Um, I feel like their text ads are having some some headwinds. Mm-hmm. But you uh, you can really advertise through the their Google Shopping. Um, and once you start using it, it's it's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, people see a picture. They they can compare prices from eight, ten, twelve, fifty different websites, depending on what the product is, mm-hmm. and pick which one you know suits their needs. Whether it's by who has a lot of reviews, who has the best price, who you know doesn't offer tax in their area. So what else? Um, what other platforms should people consider? that are worth it. Obviously you mentioned Amazon is a big one, eBay, Jet. Are there any, what other ones should people consider selling product on? Um, your, your number one is Amazon. Amazon is you know, the 800 pound gorilla yeah. for online retail. Yeah. Um, our website's been around for, uh, was it 10 months now? Um, we're into the beginning of the year. Yeah. I'm blown away by the, the traction that we've gotten in 10 months um, for a website. Really? So we were very hesitant to have our own website for a long time. Um, there's a lot of money. There's you know a lot of time into it and so forth. Sure. Design, develop, and so forth. Um, and how do you get people to it? That's been a strong, you know, strong hitter given the, the time mm-hmm. frame that it's been out there. Um, eBay seems to be you know, the number two, uh, if you're still looking to sell inside the United States. Mm-hmm. But I feel like eBay is facing headwinds um, in the future if they don't adjust some things. Uh, Jet, I I like Jet. Um, it's only been out for, you know, a short period of time, but the, the site is promising. Um, I'm a strong believer that a few years from now, it's not going to be Amazon. I don't believe that. But I think that it's going to be more than it is today by a pretty strong margin. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, if if you start getting into the Sears and the Rakuten and, you know, the new eggs, Mm -hmm. there's business to be had there. Yeah. It's just, do you think it's worth it for someone to, to go on those? As your sole source of business? Or as no, a, isn't it adjunct? Even as an adjunct, because it still does take time and resources to uh, put stuff on there. Um, if you can manage them through a single venue, mm-hmm. then yeah. But if you're having to check Sears to see if you got an order today, and you're having to check Newegg to see if you got an order today, that's tough. That's you know, that's a lot of work to have to be checking every individual venue. And mm-hmm. I know Skibana, you can have it all through one platform where you know we are at with channel advisor it's the same thing um there's incremental business but if you're putting a lot of effort you could probably do better with expanding your catalog for a, a few of the key marketplaces mm-hmm. so. would you still put all SKUs on those like you go on <laughs> new egg you put they don't charge you to put anything on there so i guess what's the downside if you do mm-hmm. Um, we don't see there being a downside to having everything out there. Um, I think our vendors really like us having, you know, their product out there and All having the exposure place. because yeah. exposure is great. Having your products everywhere and whether you're only getting a one or 2% increase in business from having it on Sears and a one or 2% from, you know, Newegg or Rakuten, um, it's still, you know, some percentage. So it adds up. Um, and maybe they are just kind of browsing around on Newegg for a computer, which is what they're known for. But they say, hey, I like that widget. I'm going to, you know, when I do go to Amazon and buy something, yeah. I'm going to buy it there. Or they see that you give them a good experience on Newegg, and maybe they do buy, you know, from your own website. Right. Um, there's, you know, we just we don't see a downside to it at all. Yeah. Um, and once we started branching out into the, the international markets, it's a whole other beast and animal on its own. Yeah. But, what made you uh, decide to do that? Because that is a, another uh, headache, possibly. It, really trying to you know 
how do you maintain a 40% growth rate year over year, which is what we definitely plan and expect to do. Mm -hmm. um, if we go from doing 1.5 million orders on Amazon to what, 2. Point, you know, 2.1 or so, um, 2.25 uh, a year um, on Amazon, that's a big catalog change. Right. And if e-commerce is only growing at 15%, we have to grow the catalog the rest of the way to get there. Right. But if we can just list everything out onto a, another marketplace and mm -hmm. Amazon, you know, international marketplace or whatever the other, you know, venues are that are, are out there, um, you don't have to grow your catalog as much. And if we go from 10,000 SKUs to 14,000 SKUs, which is a 40% change, um, it's a whole lot harder to go from 14 to, you know, whatever 40% more than that is, mm -hmm. than it is, you know. Branch out to another country. Yeah. So how do you decide which countries to branch out into, or can you just do them all at once? Uh, it, you, I guess if you have the manpower and the, the patience to do them all at once, you can. Um, we're looking at the UK and Canada as the, the go-to places. Um, Canada's not too difficult because it, you know, if you're up north, which we aren't, but it's, you can drive there, you can get freight there via the road. Um, Europe and the UK, um, really Europe, I, they're synonymous to me, sorry. But, uh, going to the UK, there's a lot of business to be had there. Um, shipping is your nightmare though. Shipping, mm -hmm. the AT, you got to pay the queen for, you know, her, her cut of the pie and import duty, being the importer of record, all, all that is a, a nightmare. Um, it's, and even at our scale, it's a nightmare. Mm. Uh, you know, it's something that I wish there was easier ways um, to deal with it, to grow that business. Mm -hmm. But, you know, every country wants to make it difficult for you. They want their peace, right? Yeah. Um, what can you tell me about the website? Because it took, it seems like you took a lot of care into the layout, way, or where things are. Yep. Is there um, a certain, can you talk about the thought process, um, you know, conversion wise and why you put certain things where um, and what and why you did it? We consulted a lot with our designer mm -hmm. um, when it was being developed and rolled out. Uh, as to how we wanted to look and feel. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Right. Um, you really don't. It's not something that if you look at 100 other really good websites or 10 really other good other websites, that you can't kind of surmise what is Pottery Barn doing or what mm -hmm. is you know Wayfair doing, what is Amazon doing, and where do they put stuff? Mm -hmm. And why do you think they put it there? Mm -hmm. They've probably already done that research for you. Right, right. You know, they know where the, the buy box should be. They know where the, you know, the little cart should be and, and so forth right. on your page. Um, you know, if you look at all kinds of different websites, they all tend to take the same shape and form. Yeah. Um, what surprised you with what the designer said that was working well in e-commerce? Um, Really, what surprised me the most was I gave them a, a lot of free reign of this is this is our kind of vision, but it's not a it's not set in stone mm -hmm. that you know give us some some ideas and because our ideas aren't always the right ones you know we listen to everybody on everything that we do mm -hmm. um, sometimes it goes in one ear and out the other if we think it's a terrible idea mm -hmm. but at the same time you know you at least had the opportunity to get that that feedback um you know they've they they still work with us um on a consistent basis and are still giving us input how do we get more natural search traffic mm -hmm. uh, you know through seo and so forth um how do we you know really structure our our landing pages which is a you know a constant process mm -hmm. um you know that they build, you know, websites for countless companies and they're doing it all day long. They know what works. So you right. just kind of take a lot of what they say as gospel, um, you know, 
but don't be afraid to ask questions of anything. Mm. Um, so what they say worked that you were surprised with with the landing pages? Um, really, it's, it's how you structure a lot of the, the categorization. Um, giving people a, a a clear flow from mm -hmm. uh, where they get to the website to how they navigate to you know yeah. home and kitchen to small appliances to mm -hmm. blenders and so yeah. forth that I'm just I looking over here because I'm looking at your I have another screen here I'm looking at yeah. the I'm not I'm, I'm not no, part of eye contact. I've got four. But, okay. Got four yeah, here, I so know. I'm so I'm just looking at our pampered home and how you have the categories. You have home and kitchen, toys and games, baby, health and fitness, beauty supplies, pet supplies, and brands. Because when I first went to the site, it, it has a really, um, really nice layout and it almost easily allows me to kind of go down. And the next column is like new arrivals on sale and best sellers. And then the next is just a bunch of the top, you know, brand products. Um, yep. So I just really, I wanted you to talk about that because I knew there was like a method to why you put things on the page there. We looked at how our, our categories were laid out on Amazon as well. Because mm -hmm. Amazon has categorization yeah. um, of home and kitchen yep. and, you know, electronics and so on and so forth. Yeah. And we don't sell in all those categories, but we can at least take the ones that we do and not m mimic exactly, but, you know, close enough mm -hmm. uh, that it works for, for our catalog. Gotcha. Um, and really, you know, you want to keep the, the most important information above the fold yeah. on your page. Yeah. Um, beyond that, it's just what the standard layout is right. um, of, you know, any website, you know. I'm sure that we looked at, you know, Pottery Barn and Wayfair and, you know, your big e-commerce sites. Mm -hmm. That's where they have stuff. Let's, and I probably scribbled it out on a piece of paper and I scanned it in to my scanner and sent it over to the designer and said, yeah. uh, you know, that's what's working and just yeah. why reinvent the wheel. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel as far as how stuff's laid out. It's how you deal with your customers. It's what yeah. you offer them. Yeah. It's really been what we've we've strived to to reinvent of sorts. Yeah, that's uh, one thing I did get with the limited information I could find about you. I did get Tom that that's one of the biggest things that you take pride in is the great customer service. Um, so, what ways do you use customer service that other companies should be modeling? Um, you know, you want to you want to listen to the customer. You want to be able to to help them. if they have an issue. Just think of how you want to be treated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I call up whatever company, they screwed up my my order. I go to dinner and they screwed up my my meal. Um, it's it might not be the the server's fault of sorts, and it's it's likely not the customer service person's fault for screwing up whatever they got. Right. But take ownership of it. Mm -hmm. You know, apologize. Say, hey, I'm sorry that you got this and it was broken. I'm, we shipped you wine glasses. And they're fragile. Um, I'm sorry they broke. I'm sorry that, you know, whatever it may be. And we'll fix it, mm -hmm. you know. And there's a lot of times that we'll lose money, sizable, you know, amounts comparatively to the order to make it right for that customer. Mm -hmm. But if you if you put that time and effort into making sure that you get the orders right, you're going to have to deal with so many fewer customers that got something wrong. Um, and our, our error percentage with our orders is, it's exceptionally small. Um, you know, if I was to pull it up, it's one, one every couple of days and we're doing thousands a day of, of orders. Um, which is great. You know, there's still customer service issues. Hey, my order didn't get here on time. Or where is my order? And those are easy enough to deal with. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's really that negative experience that you want to turn mm -hmm. into a positive one. Mm -hmm. Because that customer is then going to say, hey, I ordered from our parent home and they shipped me wine glasses and they were broken into bits when they got to me. But they shipped me new ones. They were here, you know, nice and quick. Right. And, you know, they took care of me as a customer. And... Then they're going to go tell their friends and say, I had a positive experience. Instead of ranting on some website about, you know, hey, I got, 
I got this pack of vacuum bags and it didn't fit, right. um, which happens a lot. You know, hey, I, they don't know what they want or they don't know what they need for vacuum bags. They buy something they that they the think will thing. work. Yeah, I ripped them open and I bought them and I didn't get the right thing. You know, that's fine. Sorry, sorry about your luck. Um, let's get it fixed. Uh, right. Let's figure out what you need. Versus just telling them, hey, you know, go to go to hell. <laughs> you know? So you we teach your customer, care. the people who answer the phone, the customer service, the one take ownership. Of, uh, you know, apologize, take ownership of it and just fix it. How much leeway do they have to just, yeah, this is a $800 vacuum or something, we'll just ship you a new one, or how much, how much leeway do they have, or do they have, is there a certain process, you know, as um, someone listening who maybe manages a lot of staff, what things do you put in place, or how do um, you, how do you my, lead that? My customers, I give them a lot of uh, leeway, and mm -hmm. I used to be a, a real micromanager as we were a smaller company. But, you know, yeah, if there's an $800 vacuum cleaner and they got, you know, the wrong one, yeah, let me know. Um, that, you know, I don't want you just shipping out another $800 cleaner to somebody because they said they got the wrong something or it came broken or whatever. Let's, let's figure that one out. Right. But if it's, you know, hey, I got glasses and they're shattered to bits, yeah, that, they've got a lot of leeway there. But, you know, as far as, my style of managing now, yeah. my style of managing when we were small was I was, my office, my desk was in the warehouse. Um, you know, I was from here to, you know, 30 feet away was people packing and processing an order. Mm -hmm. um, no walls, no nothing. Um, that we could micromanage a lot easier. And as we've scaled, I've given up a lot of that, uh, a lot of that control to people. And it's really liberating. You know, I, I know that when you're small, it's, you want to protect it and so forth. But as you get bigger, other people are, are going to help you run your business. And that kept me up a lot of nights trying to do everything. Um, I, you know, I, I, I would stress out about it, freak out. I couldn't sleep. Went to the doctor because I couldn't sleep. Really? Um, and it was, you know, the stress of trying to make everything perfect myself um, just was, was tough. Mm -hmm. So give, give some of that control up to your, your customer service mm -hmm. people, your warehouse people, and they'll take pride in it. You know, they will. Um, and they should be, you know, they should be thanked for it. And I, I don't, if any of my employees watch this, please know that I am thanking you for your, you know, your hard work. Uh, because for me, if you don't hear from me, you know, you're, you're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. Um, and the longer you're here and you, you work here, you know that, um, cause I'm not going out there patting everyone on the butt saying good job. Uh, you'll know if you screw up. Uh, yeah. So how do you handle that as a leader? You know, the, when things are going well and smooth, that's good. How do yeah. you handle as a leader if things aren't going well or someone makes a mistake. You, you want to deal with the problem and use it as a learning experience. You know, if you ship something, you ship something to Amazon FBA and you ship 20 of them and you labeled them wrong, you stickered them wrong and, you know, you get a customer that says, I got the wrong thing and say, you know what, what did, what did you get? Is it, is it something that really could be, is it a picking error? What does the sticker say on it? If not, don't wait for that next customer or two to tell you, hey, I got something wrong as well, and you sell through them and you get them all as a return. Pull them back. It's not that much money. Mm -hmm. It's a whole lot better to, you know, to bring them back, assess it, get them back to Amazon once you know they're right, mm -hmm. than just gambling on the next 20 customers getting something wrong. Um, and if it is wrong, pull everybody aside. It literally, I'll go out in the warehouse sometimes and just yell, hey, everybody, get over here. You know, we're going to learn from this in, you know, 60 seconds or less. Right. And you deal with it and on your way, you know, get back to work. Mm -hmm. But that 60 seconds or two minutes or three minutes is a whole lot more valuable than just having everybody 
mindlessly go and do something wrong a hundred times over, mm-hmm. uh, you know, what does it really cost you to take a few minutes and you know, an hour? You know, it's maybe ten bucks. You know, fifteen dollars in labor to uh, to have that learning experience. And everybody now knows what it is instead of just hearing it through the grapevine at lunch or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, Tom, we talked about your conversation with Chad and the big things is what's next? What's on the horizon? What do you see as the next phase for our pampered home? Um, we're going to continue expanding our catalog. We're always searching for new products. Um, we're really doing a lot to build out our website, advertise, um, we're building some of those strategic relationships with vendors that we, we have, um, you know, taking some of the products that we think we're stepping out a little bit more and taking some products that are doing okay and really running with them and advertising them, advertising them with the vendor and building out, you know, building up your sales ranks on Amazon, getting some traffic to the website. Um, our website's growing at a, a very solid clip, far more than 40% a year. Um, you know, when we look at just month over month, it's it's growing a lot faster than any other part of our business right now. Um, and trying to build that out into a uh, a name, you know, people that know about it. Excuse me. Um, and are constantly coming to us. Um, they bought a blender and now they're going to buy a vacuum and now they're going to buy a, you know, a toaster and then a baby stroller, you know, and a gift, a toy. They're going to buy a couple gifts for their friends. They're going to buy a, you know, a bridal shower gift. They're going to buy their wine glasses. Um, and give them that level of service that they, you know, they deserve as a paying customer um, and offer them products that are, are unique. To, to what, you know, we don't offer everything. We, we offer far less than a lot of other sellers do. But the stuff we do offer is quality goods. Um, and try to get them to, you know, to come back. Um, it's a whole lot cheaper to, to have a customer come back to you than to tr- always find a new one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a big push of ours is, yeah. is growing that... Uh, that portion of it. Yeah. So, Tom, since this, this is this Hubani Commerce Mastery Series, I just have a few more questions. This has been fantastic. Um, the first is best sellers. What surprised you the most as far as either a product or category that has been just selling like gangbusters for you? Um, I'm always surprised at how many you know vacuum bags we sell. Um, I am surprised every time I hear someone talk about selling vacuum bags. Yeah. Um, you know, we do, that, that's a big, just from a, a quantity sold. Yeah. Um, it's amazing uh, how many you can sell. Uh, they're not, you know, necessarily the most expensive item. Uh, so you're not doing a huge amount of revenue from it. Uh, and margins pretty much razor thin. Yeah. Uh, but... What's really, you know, starting to surprise us is some of the, you know, we do well with pets, you know, it, it's, that's kind of an emerging category for us um, of sorts. We still don't have as much data as we would like uh, because it's new to us. Um, but our, we're our pampered home. So home is still our, our bread and butter, our mm-hmm. backbone to mm-hmm. the business is what do people buy for their really home and kitchen right. is what we would you know class it as a brand. Um, and we're not trying to you know fix what's not broken. It's working for us. It's worked year over year right. uh, for a lot of time. So, well, we branch out and we do add you know some pet stuff, some baby stuff. Some we're doing you know well with the beauty category, even though it's it's really gated and restricted, so you do have to be very careful there. Um, what do you mean it's restricted? Uh, you can't just go buy, uh, you know, Calvin Klein cologne or something from a wholesaler and list. You might be able to do that product, but for example, you can't buy Calvin Klein cologne from a wholesaler and list it on Amazon to sell it. Um, part of it is Amazon's stance on beauty stuff is if you ingest it and eat it, 
or you put it on your skin, your face, whatever, that they want to vet you as a seller first, hmm. uh, which is, you know, it'll, you'll just have a re- listing restriction. You can't list it until you've either, you know, proven your, I'll use the word worthiness, but it's not, you know. You're pretty it, vetted, though. Yeah, we're, we're fine. Right. <laughs> <That's what laughs> I'm yeah, we can, uh, you know, fortunately, and, you know, knock on wood. Um, but, yeah, if we want to sell beauty products, it's a matter of, you know, proving the authenticity and where mm. you get it, chain of, you know, not chain of command, but chain you. of ownership. Right, um, right. We just buy it from the guy out of his van who was, you know, Pouring selling. the bottles that say Kelvin Klein. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and everything we buy is all, all legitimate goods and so forth. Yeah. And we buy, you know, the vast majority of our stuff direct from the manufacturer. Mm. So, you know, if, if Amazon wants to see an invoice of where something yeah. came from, I'll just send it right over. Right. Uh, you know, there's no there's no reason to hide any of it. I don't. If Amazon really wants to know the vendor, they have what ten thousand people or something probably buying product. They don't need me to tell them where to buy it. So why do I care if mm-hmm. I send them an invoice? Right. So what are some of the best actual tips? Since we're drawing to a close here, what are some of the best actual tips people should start doing right now to increase their e-commerce business? Because we talked a lot about a lot of different things. Where should people start? Um, you first have to have, have an idea of what you want to sell and sell something that you like, be passionate about it. Know that you're not going to get bored of it, you know, two weeks from now and just get lazy and sloppy. Mm -hmm. Um, the second is organization that as an e-commerce retailer, and we suffer from it sometimes as well with the volume that we do is staying super organized, knowing what you have, where you have it. Um, and that organization will make your life so much easier uh, in the long run. We've had the opportunity to tour an Amazon warehouse uh, just recently. And the amount of what you would say is empty space, meaning the aisles, room to move around and and see what you have, Mm -hmm. is they have a lot of money to build these very large warehouses. But there's a reason why there's, you know, great organization, Everything's labeled. Everything has its own place, so they can find it. Yeah. And yeah, right. They're in. Are they in. They have a lot of warehouses in Vegas area. Yeah, they have. Uh, I think they have a few in Vegas, yeah. uh, Reno, Phoenix. Uh, yeah. We actually went all the way to the East Coast to view one, um, but you know, jumped at the chance because yeah. not every day that they, you know, they invite you there. So what did you um, learn? What else did you learn by by going up close and personal? Know. Unfortunately, I, I do have a non-disclosure Oh, really? Program. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of non-disclosure agreements with Amazon for some of the, you know, stuff that we've been like given. This top secret drone that's dropping things. Yeah, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing like crazy that, you know, there's robots walking around or something, uh, you know, that is just going to blow your mind. But some of the, you know, stuff. Some but, of the and, procedures, you mean, they want to keep private or... Yeah, I I would think so. Yeah. Um, but you know, from the layout of everything, we and we run into space constraints just because we don't have the square footage that we need. But when you're there and you can see how clean, literally, I would have eaten a sandwich right off the floor. Mm. That's how awesome their warehouse. It's clean. It's organized. There's empty space. And um, I tell our warehouse all the time since we've been there, there is nothing wrong with having some nice empty space to work in Mm -hmm. there's you know just just imagine if your desk is piled with clutter uh, versus you have you have space to operate in Uh, you know you really you will get more done when you have some some space to to around in Um, that's interesting so do they only invite like some of the top sellers is that um you know we we're a strategic account with Amazon, um, so we have a an account manager who put our name on the list and was invited. But I know that you can go to like a, a commercial, like the the grade school tour. You know, they'll take you through, they'll show you some stuff. But as like a, a seller in their uh, program, we got to see a, a little bit more and hear a little bit more than the grade school tour. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, it's it's they're not 
all of a sudden turning over their their software. So, uh, <laughs> um, I, you know, I would be more than happy to to jump at the chance to to lease it from them or something. But it's there's a reason why Amazon is as big as they are, and some of that their systems that are in place will blow your mind. Mm. Um, if you ever get a chance to to go tour one, even the the grade school level one, just to see inside is really, um, you know, you'd you'd really have a lot of fun. So, Tom, what's been the proudest moment that you've had with the business? Um, I take a lot of pride in just proving people wrong. A lot of people said there's no way you're going to be able to sell stuff online um, and make a living at it. Mm -hmm. You can sell stuff, but it's not a full-time job. It's not something that you're going to be able to pay, you know, ever have a life doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this was, you know, what? 8, 10, 12 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and if somebody tells me I can't do something, they're pretty much daring me to do it. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't make money doing this or you can't, you know, make a living doing that. And proving them wrong was really a, uh, not, you know, I'm, I'm proud of proving them wrong, but it, it's really that motivating factor there. Mm-hmm. Uh, once we hit a million sales a year, I really felt like, Wow, um, it's amazing. And I, you know, I have a personal like ritual of sorts. You know, you always want to set yourself a a reward, a personal reward mm-hmm. of once you hit whatever that milestone is, do something. Take yourself out to yeah. dinner. Yeah. You know, buy yourself a. So what's you know, yours? Yeah. Um, because of the amount of credit card purchases that we do, um, we have a lot of credit card points. You can fly uh, around the world a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, we, we tend to go on some uh, some decent vacations. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I've I've got to enjoy enjoy that. You know, the credit card points mm-hmm. are are great to just be able to you know book a flight, book a hotel, whatever, all on points. Um, and you know, in the beginning, it was you know me and my wife would just go out to dinner, and well, you know make it a, a special, you know, get all dressed up and mm-hmm. go out to a nice meal. Um, but it, it can be anything. You know, it could be you're going to buy yourself, you know, if, if my wife had her way, she would, every time, you know, a milestone was hit, she's going to buy herself a new purse. Um, make it something. Yeah. Uh, because if, if it's something that means a lot to you and, and you like doing it, um, you're going to work hard to, to achieve that goal. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, I like that's something that I always work towards yeah. is achieving that that next milestone. Yeah, uh, I mean, after not taking a paycheck for years, not sleeping or very little, yeah, and I, stressing out. What's the most um, indulging, you know, night out or vacation that you ended up giving yourself much um, deserved? As far as night out, I would be embarrassed. To <laughs> <laughs> and it's not nothing embarrassing like we went streaking or something, but right. we'll go to some, some nice dinners. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, you go find yourself a nice steakhouse or mm-hmm. whatever type of food you like. Yeah. And me and my wife will book dinner at, you know, 7 o'clock and we'll shut the restaurant down just sitting there, you know, talking for yeah. hours. And, you know, we'll turn a, a dinner into a three or three and a half hour tour. Mm-hmm. Um, not eating the whole time, but, you know, just enjoying, relaxing, just yeah. decompress after hitting that milestone. Um, you know, as far as vacations, I like the beach, um, you know, Hawaii, Mexico, <laughs> Southern California, uh, that we've been able to travel there yeah. uh, a number of times and, and really like it, so... Everybody's different, though. Uh, Tom, this um, has been amazing. And my last question is, um, tell me, what advice would your wife give people? And <laughs> how much um, she's really contributed to the business? Um, as I can her, see, just the name in itself, she, she, uh, that's amazing. She, but what advice would she give people? Um, you know... She 
can you give me a second? Yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, <laughs> I, I discussed this with her last night. Yeah. Um, you can edit edit this. No, in, I right? don't edit anything. It's just. You know, oh really? Yeah. Oh, I don't want to have that air. No, that's fine. Um, it's like a normal conversation, you know. It's, yeah, you know her. Uh, her feedback would, jokingly, she would probably say, "Just listen to her, and everything will be good." Right, right. Um, Which is probably but, partially true. <laughs> in reality, <laughs> uh, you know, it's. She's the one that really got annoyed buying something that she didn't like. She doesn't yeah. want to buy vacuum bags. It's yeah. do something that makes you happy. Yeah. Um, and from our sta- from us as you know, husband and wife, as personal couple, not business related, right. we're if your business has ups and downs, don't freak out. Um, this whole business could go away. And as long as, you know, it's the two of us and we've got our dog, um, we'll be fine. Like, with it, you want to go through, and we went through some really hard times. Um, You want to go through some hard times to know what the, even medium, good times, whatever they are, are going to be. Our hardest times were were tough and they were when this business you know started right before it started when you know things were you know for us bad um but having those bad times taught us to you know to work hard to you know save money to enjoy what you have Mm -hmm. you know more so than more so than buying that purse of sorts. The purse is nice. Mm. But, you know, as long as you're healthy and, you know, you can yeah. have some, you know, some food to, to eat and a roof over your head. Yeah. You have that Everything gratitude is- and appreciation for where, yeah. you, for where you were. She taught me a lot of that. Yeah. And, she's, you know, we stuck, stuck it out um, through that really bad time. And we had, you know, some support there from, from people. And I know that I never want to go back there. Uh, it's almost like outside of, you know, you graduate high school or you graduate college and go broke. Just, I don't care. Go broke for six months. Right. Have a hard, hard time, hard experience. Right. Set up all your credit cards. Live on, you know, the change out of your couch cushions. I guarantee you'll work harder for the rest of your life after mm. that. Yeah. Um, I know I did. I know, you know, because you, you know, you don't want to, you know, go back to, uh, do I have, you know, do I have top ramen or do I just save it for tomorrow? Yeah. I'm not a ramen eater, but hypothetically, right. uh, you, you know, you have to have a respect for what you could have, you know, yeah. because it could be. Everything could go away tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't do that. I actually don't do this business for the money. Mm. I don't at all. Um, I do it because I like it. I, I like I like putting up the next bigger number. I like selling more of that vacuum bag than I did last year. Um, it's a personal competition. I just want to, you know, do better myself. Yeah. Uh, and the you know the real support in this business. My dad, who's the other owner, we want to. We probably don't need to continue growing the business to pay our bills for quite some time. Yeah. But we want to. You know, we want to. You know, give people a job. We want to keep them their job. We want to. You know, to push ourselves. Um, Because you go through a hard time, and yeah, you'll you'll learn to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's that would be her advice. Yeah. Tom, this has been fantastic. Thank you finally for speaking out and uh, not uh, always under the radar. Uh, where should we point people towards? What site should we uh, send them to? You know, if uh, our parent home is our website, um, you know, you can, you can contact them for there. They, I don't just give out my email address. I'll end up with, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> emails more than I need in a given day. Yeah. Um, 
But, uh, you know, if, if somebody wants to get a hold of me or anyone at this company, uh, our website's Our Pampered Home. Yeah. Uh, we sell on Amazon as Our Pampered Home uh, is our seller name. We've pretty much branded ourselves that way yeah. everywhere. And uh, if anybody has, you know, questions, comments, whatever, talk to us. Um, we stop being so closed off. Yeah. Uh, and I, just, I wish that there was a lot more openness in e-commerce because yeah. I remember, and still to this day, there's questions that we have that I know somebody else has the answer to. Right. But if you call up, you know, the guy next to you selling, uh, you're Unless not you're really sure. With that, them. Yeah. You don't know what that reception will be. Um, so, yeah, we're, we've become more of an open book now because you realize that one one person can't necessarily put you out of business. You can only put yourself out of business. Yeah. Um, so comparing notes is not a bad thing. Yeah. Well, Tom, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. No Thank you. I appreciate your time.